Hello, and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Marie Arana. I'm the Literary Director of the Library of Congress. I'm here with Heather Cox Richardson. Welcome, Heather. Oh, it's uh, such a joy to be here. It's wonderful to have you. Um, Heather's featured book at the festival is How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Demo Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. It's a great book. And it's a great presentation that you've done, Heather, for us uh, on the, uh, uh, the history and biography stage of the festival. So I encourage everybody to go there to um, Library of Congress, or, or excuse me, to the Library of Congress's site, which is loc.gov slash bookfest, and you will find it there. It's a, a real pleasure to have you here, um, Heather. Welcome. So well, thank you for to be here, but I want to say first to your to the people listening, the Library of Congress is one of our national jewels. And if you are not supporting it and have not been, drop everything and make plans to do that. It's like to, to people like me, it's like our I don't even know what our cathedral. Um, so anything I can do to help the Library of Congress or to encourage people to participate in anything to do with the Library of Congress, I'm here for. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Um, that's that's great to hear. And I would love to hear if you've actually done some of your research at the Library of Congress. That would that would be my first question to you. Oh, totally. Yes. In fact, you know, so I work in congressional papers and I work in personal papers. So the Library of Congress has, you know, so I'll tell you a story about that. I, I've, I've been in the Library of Congress the, so much that my my next to my I, my driver's license is my Library of Congress ID. But you know, at one point in the 1980s or the 1990s, you changed the carpet in the reading room of the Madison building and yeah. it was squares that were purple and they made me seasick when I read. And that was actually a real problem. I had to put my head down so I couldn't see the purple moving when my eyes went across the pages. But you know, I've seen, not only have I seen Lincoln papers there, of course, which people are interested in, but you had a librarian once who's thanked in one of my books because we got to be friends and at one point, um, he said, I wanna show you something. And he brought out, this is in the manuscript room, an actual document that was signed Rasputin. Like, I can't read Russian, but it was his signature. So I have seen in the Library of Congress a piece of paper with Rasputin's Rasputin signature on it, which is like, does it get cooler than that? Oh, that's thrilling. That is absolutely thrilling. You know, we have those thrills every day at the Library of Congress, and um, I urge people to come and visit so you can see the signature of Rasputin as well. <laughs> so that's, that's a wonderful anecdote. Um, uh, Heather is a, uh, apart from being a, a, a distinguished historian who has given us a half dozen books, she's also a professor at Boston College, and her books, it seems to me, Heather, that every time you've published a book, you have turned the prism on a subject. I mean, you've, it's always a, a, a new door that you open, uh, and you certainly have opened a new door with, with how the South won the Civil War, and you've had a tremendous reaction from, from uh, your public. And uh, I just want to ask you to start off, um, how has that, has that surprised you? Has that warmed you? Has that scared you? <laughs> how, how has been your, your reaction to the, the, the sort of electric um, uh, force that this book has been in the public sort of? Aren't we, all, aren't we all in a place where we're sort of isolated? So people ask me how I have reacted to the, the attention that this book has gotten. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a bubble like, like I think everybody else is. Um, you know, I just this morning saw my son for the first time in six months because we're really not out in the world. So uh, am I surprised? No, I'm very excited that people care and that people recognize that we're in a bizarre moment that speaks to our history and to our future. And I'm, I'm, I'm very warmed by that. But it really hasn't penetrated my bubble, which is my world has looked the same now for a number of years, but certainly since March, when I sit in this study with these books behind me and this laptop, and I write. And now, of course, there are many, many, many more people reading me than there were even a year ago. But it all looks the same to me. The difference is just that I'm part of a much bigger community. And that's really exciting. 
Uh, that's that's a that's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Uh, well, the how how the South won the Civil War. Let's just let's just do a little uh, bubble recap of the book. It's basically um, all the prejudices, all the racial hierarchy, all the racism, all the um, uh, the, the, the the subjugation of women, uh, all of that traveled west after the Civil War, and it was just recreated and re-stamped and relived uh, uh, West. Um, and um, am I recapping that properly? Yes, although the, the first piece of it is the idea that really we tend sometimes to think about the idea of American equality as being somehow completely different than the repression that was in the early colonial years and early America, the repression of women and African Americans and indigenous peoples. And by the 1840s, uh, Chinese and Mexicans and Mexican Americans, we tend to think of those things as opposites. And what I was arguing was picking up an early idea, earlier idea from Edmund Morgan, and who said that you couldn't have the concept of equality without the concept of inequality that baked into this extraordinarily exciting idea of American equality that anybody can construct their own their own future. You also had, uh, by definition, to have written out of that body politic, if you will, more than half the population. So that what that did is it gave the language for oligarchs to go ahead and destroy democracy. Because it's actually really a question: How does a democracy kick up a moment like the present when we have money and and property and everything moving upward at such an extraordinary rate to less than one percent of our society? You know, how why did we agree to that? Why did we vote for that? when we're actually a democracy. And what I'm suggesting is that oligarchs manage to, to get votes by telling the people who are privileged in the system, the white men who are privileged in the system, that if women and people of color get rights, it's going to mean they lose it. Because in addition to that idea that equality depends on inequality, a corollary to that, I argued, was this to say that if you can't have equality unless all these people are unequal, if those people become equal, they're going to destroy equality for people at the top. So that idea is, I'm suggesting, what led to the rise of the elite slaveholders in the 1850s, and they're taking over of the American system, including, by the way, the Supreme Court, which is an interesting thing to think about right in this weekend. Um, but the, the Civil War should have ended that. Le Abraham Lincoln and his Republican Party said, no, no, that's not what democracy is all about. Democracy really does mean that everyone is created equal, although, of course, they're only looking at men at that point. Uh, but they are looking, by the way, not simply at African Americans, but also at Irish people born uh, at the time who were considered inferior by white uh, by white Americans, but also they're very concerned about the the laws in the West that are discriminating against Chinese and against Mexicans and Mexican Americans. So it is a broad concept, although it's not yet informed by gender. But that um, the Civil War should have meant that we got rid of this paradox once and for all, but we didn't because right then uh, settlers from the East moved to the West, and when they moved to the West they fit their ideology that a few white men should run everything quite naturally over the history of the American West, where there was a long history among from the Spanish and then from the Mexicans. Mexicans and then from the Americans moving in of denigrating people by race and by gender. And so that ideology of the Confederacy fits so naturally right there. Um, and, and it really gave, gave was, was, in, was personified by the idea of the American cowboy, who, although in reality, about a third of cowboys were people of color, the cowboy in American mythology is a white man and very much in a, in a world of brothers, women have roles only as women or, I'm sorry, only as wives and mothers or as sex objects. Um, and the idea was that these cowboys were taking on what they called savages and spreading American society westward. And what I argued in the book was that with the re resurrection of that ideology in the American West, once you get the rise of the West as a political entity, and people tend not to think about the West that way, but it's a very powerful political block after about 1890. Once you got that rise, gradually that ideology that had begun in the Confederacy and spread to the West manages to spread its way back across America. And we're in a moment right now that looks very much like the 1850s. So it was a, it was an, a thesis that I think tries to, not I think, that tries to explain all of America in history through a particular lens and explain how we got to where we are right now. Yeah, and that's that's such a great concept, Heather, because um, yeah, democracy is not 
pie, right? You, you don't take a piece and then somebody else doesn't have a piece, uh, which is, gives a, 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 a new twist to the concept of an American pie. Here's a question from Don Mooney, who asks you, uh, your daily Facebook posts are incredibly informative. Do you collaborate with others to get diverse perspectives on the quick cycle news? Thank you. Uh, that's a, that's actually a wonderful um, a wonderful question, and one of the things that's interesting about uh, the, those letters, which I never intended to write, by the way, is that I think they're a new kind of journalism. So now I have no research assistants when I do those, but I often um, have people write to me during the day and say, "Hey, did you see the story over here?" And you may not, you may may or may not have been reading me back then. But way back in like um, March, maybe April, maybe um, there was an event that was canceled in Ohio, and it was uh, it was the in which um, and it was all it's bodybuilders and stuff, and I'd never heard of it. I mean, to me, it was like really. And he, the guy, wrote to me and he said, "This is really important." And I looked into it. I thought, you know, he's right. It is really important. So I wrote about it that night. Well, then it turned out just, uh, and I won't say by chance, because I feel like I've got eyes all over the ground here. It turned out that was the first major event that was canceled nationally. And it turned out to be a really big deal. I promise you, I would never have known about that if that person hadn't written to me. So what you're really seeing is, um, and I keep saying I'm a translator, that is really what I feel like. Like I read the news obsessively, obviously, and I'm reading it with a historical eye. Is this gonna be important in a hundred mm -hmm. years? or is it not? So I'm doing it that way. But I have all these people out there going, hey, I don't know if you saw this, but but because I follow the, uh, you know, the bodybuilding community, I know this is a really big deal. And I'm smart enough to know the bodybuilding community is an important thing, but I don't follow it. So I feel like you're, what you're seeing with those letters is somebody with historical perspective perspective so that I kind of have a sense of whether like I wasn't all excited about Kanye West when he when he announced he was going to become a presidential candidate because I'm like we get this crap all the time every presidential election I know it's not that big a deal in history you know we've always had this but you you're seeing somebody with that eye who has the great benefit now of what is increasingly to my mind crowdsourced information and I have people all over the world, by the way, who write to me and say, hey, you know, I don't know if you saw this, but the U.S. is in the news in Ukraine right now because of X. So that um, I don't I don't officially have anybody working with me on this end, but I have a lot of people on your end sending me stuff. And and I can also often tell that some something is important because, you know, 35 people send me the same article. That's pretty wonderful. Uh, crowdsourcing is marvelous in, in some respects. Yeah, I, I think it's a new form of journalism, to be honest. I was reading some a Neiman report the other day that says this is a big deal on the African-American community because of the rise of sort of crowdsourced um, uh, um, media. And I thought, well, you know, I think, uh, honestly, I think Josh Marshall was there first with Talking Points Memo, but that's pretty much what I'm doing. I'm not yeah, a journalist. We used to call it grassroots, right? And now we call it crowdsource. But uh, here's Diane Holland with a good question for you. And it's about one of your colleagues, one, uh, one of your colleague historians, I should say. And she asks, have you read Jill Lepore? She has almost a mirror image theory of your idea of the use of the, of the language of equality by oligarchs in our history, in which she has shown that excluded groups also use the same language to expand equality and rights. I think you are both right. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this corollary uh, thread in our history. Well, I don't know which of, uh, of Professor Lepore's uh, books or articles you're talking about. I certainly know her work. It is, I think, um, not, not a different thesis to say that in American history, um, people who are anxious to get rights use the language of the Declaration of Independence, that same language that Lincoln uses, Lincoln and the Republican Party use, and people who are eager to, who already have rights and are eager to limit the rights for other people tend to stand on the language of the Constitution. So the the her frame, if she's working with that kind of a frame, um, and which I think probably she might be from the, from the, her, a lot of her or other work. Um, I don't think that really stands against um, against this idea of being able to mobilize a certain kind of language for political control. Thank you for that. Um, Sarah Cunningham wants to know, um, I'm persuaded by your thesis, uh, you're talking about um, how, the, how the South won the Civil War, obviously. How did you come to it? 
um, excuse me, I just, it slipped for me. Um, how did, how did you come to it? I'm a high school teacher and would love to know what are the two or three key turning point pieces of evidence that were most key to your research? Uh, that is, a, you know, this is why I love doing these things. The questions are great. That's a great question. This I did not think was a book. I thought it was a cute little article. And I came to it, I think, because of many years of reading very widely in American history. And it was clear to me that the movement West after the Civil War was huge in the resurrection of that ideology of the Confederacy. Um, but with the piece that is was, was really new to me, although maybe not all... Uh, I wrote a book on the Wounded Knee Massacre, and what was interesting about that, and you've seen me write about this in a lot of places, is that the Republican Party between 1889 and 1890 lets in six new Western states. And they let in those six new Western states, even though the Dakotas really don't have any people in them, nor does Wyoming or Idaho at that point, or Montana, which are five of the states that come in. Washington did have a lot of people in it. Um, but, uh, but there were far more people in Arizona and New Mexico, and they did not, of course, come in until 1912. But um, that, that act of letting in those states in 1889 and 1890 in 12 months, it's a huge acquisition of states, the largest since the original 13, they did it quite deliberately and quite articulately to go ahead and change American politics. You know, they say we're basically using the West here to make up for the fact we can no longer trust the, the uh, South to have any Republican electors, basically they're concerned about, but also senators. And so I was aware that the West was an important political piece to the American nation, but, and I certainly had written books about the importance of the cowboy and the imagery of the American cowboy. But what was really shocking for me was the understanding, the, the growing understanding, which by the way, I've been fleshing out ever since, and it won't be in this book, but it'll be in other things, um, that the West begins to quite deliberately work as a political block with the South. Now, historians in the past have talked about how the West and the South had very had the same sort of interests in terms of finances and tariff policy mm -hmm. in the late 19th century, uh, as opposed to the East, the Northeast. But I actually started playing around with this and I don't even know how I got to it, but somehow I, I found out that there had been this group called the Trans-Mississippi Congress, which becomes known as the Trans-Mississippi Commercial Congress very quickly. And it organizes in 1890 or 1891, I don't remember which, and it is literally all the Western um, representatives come together across parties to go ahead and try and wrest political control of the country away from the American East. And they start to work with the South. And I'm thinking, well, this is like kind of weird. And then then Teddy Roosevelt gives a speech when he passes the one of the first water rights, uh, not passes, signs one of the pre first precious Congress to pass and then signs one of the first water rights acts in the country known as the Newlands Act. Um, he says, this is because of the Trans-Mississippi Congress. And I'm like, why have I never heard about this? So I'm Googling it and I discovered that on Google Books, and I'm sure they're at the Library of Congress, is this whole, this whole series of books of their minutes. And I'm reading through this stuff going, why hasn't anybody written books on this? This is like a really huge deal. So that really kind of putting that together along with the information about the fact that so many of these Westerners who show up in a lot of books as progressives are actually so reactionary in terms of their understanding of racial politics that they literally are calling for the repeal of the, the 15th Amendment and sometimes the 14th Amendment even. Um, I, it, and, you know, all these Western guys like McCa Pat McCarran, who's got the airport named after him in, in right now in Nevada, you know, they're like, they're total reactionary racists. And that, that kind of really helped to cement things. So what are the turning points in this era? Um, it's, a, there's, it's a little hard because there's, there's the literature and there's the art and there's the imagery and there's the politics and there's all those things. But, it, you know, when I teach it, one of the things that I think is hugely important is the, the admission of those new states, which again, a lot of people don't know about at all. And then, um, and then I think really the fact that when we talk about racial issues in the 19th century, we really tend to focus on African Americans and white Americans and their relationship between the, you know, especially because of the Reconstruction Amendments. But it's really, really crucial to remember that in the other half of the country, the Western half of the country, in fact, uh, the racial issues are really not centered in the late 19th century around uh, 
black Americans so much as they are around brown Americans. And those, the, 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 the issues with um, Euro-Americans and indigenous peoples, Asian peoples um, and Mexicans and Mexican Americans really have a ton to do with our understanding of racial justice in America. And they're so important. And once you figure that out and start to reincorporate that, the fact, for example, that despite the 14th and 15th amendments, um, there's going to be a whole lot of laws, state laws and territorial laws in the West that are based on that earlier um, set of laws saying that you couldn't be a citizen unless you were white and free. Um, that that changes the whole way we look at racial issues in this country. And then of course, gender issues fit into that as well. But once you recognize that as you teach, like when I do the civil rights movement now, um, I, I absolutely start with Dr. Hector Garcia and the um, the American GI Forum, which is you know based in Mexican Americans, not in uh, not in African Americans, and he organizes that right after World War II for voting rights. That's not why he starts it, but I think it changes the whole lens that you look at things with, and to my mind makes us, gives us much more full representation of what American history really is, that it's not this bifurcation between white Americans and black Americans, but rather a much larger picture of a few people holding power and everybody else somehow being divided up across race lines or gender lines or class lines to make sure they don't in fact take on a system that is really only serving a very few people. Yeah, and that's so important. Uh, and, and you've answered uh, basically Christine Dalbello's question somewhat, but I'm going to ask it anyway, just to see if there is something you can say concretely to the second part of the question. Here's her question. I agree that Native American and Asian American histories are part of American history and not niche histories. But so much of the American history curriculum is whitewashed. How do we ensure that American history covers all groups, is truthful, and is learned by all? It's a very teacher-friendly question there. Well, I love, I, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, teaching and, um, and the organizing of teaching. And, and you're actually, I think, talking about two things. One is that uh, we all, not I don't because I'm in college, but anybody who's teaching in the public school system has to answer to the state curriculum guidelines. And those are really very event and people oriented to my mind, which in a way, it kind of puts the cart in the wrong place, you know, the cart before the horse rather than the other way around. Right. So, um, so the 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 way you, I'm a huge fan of the understanding by design form of curriculum development. Although I kind of feel like that's what we've been doing all along if we're doing it right, rather than simply um, learning it when um, when Wiggins and McTie wrote that book. Um, but the, I think the way to think about teaching history is to think as they do, like what is well, what is your goal when you teach? So when I teach the first half of the US history survey, you know, my real question is, how do you build a viable nation? And in order to discuss how you build a viable nation, in fact, you have to have the push and pull of all the different peoples in that nation and a discussion of how some people get written into it, into the new nation and some people get written out. So that's a place where, you know, absolutely I cover the declaration and the constitution and the presidents and all that because you must, but, but the whole point is not that you learn who James K. Polk is, but rather you figure out how James K. Polk fits into the larger question of what makes a nation. My second half is actually the, starts with the premise of the civil war decides firmly that there is a nation but it doesn't say what it can be. So there too, you have the inclusion of all kinds of different voices. The problem with that, I find for the second half, we really need three semesters. By the time you get to the 20th century, once you have to include real engagement in foreign affairs, there's just too much to cover. There's really just too much to cover. And then I feel like when I do the 20th century, it's really spotty. That being said, you know, I understand we're in a terrible position as teachers because we have too much material to cover. And we have to, to, to struggle with the state guidelines, which again, tend to march you through, this is what Andrew Jackson did. This is what James K. Polk did, this, which is um, an organizing principle, but one that is not only Rig, uh, rigid, but also sort of boring. And um, and I think that all I can say is I hope we're at a point where we're going to be changing that. I, I will let you know that it is my hope. Um, I've had a, 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 a 
graphic novel in the works about the reconstruction era from 1865 to the present for years now and i'm hoping it's really going to come to fruition and if it does i'm hoping it will be the first of the entire sweep of american history and my hope is that they will go into middle schools and high schools that's what i'm writing them for oh, that's really good news heather that's i'm on your team i just don't know how to make it happen without changing those state guidelines yeah yeah well yeah, it's a challenge for sure. Uh, Lori Fulton has an interesting question here. She says, I look forward to reading your book, but I wonder whether you take into account that the first dozen states to give women the right to vote were in the West, and many more Western states passed women's suffrage before 19th Amendment. So, um, so that's, a, that's a wonderful question, and it's a really important question. And it, um, I, I don't really deal with that in the book. I don't think it necessarily, though, um, changes the uh, the tenor of the argument in the book in the sense that so many people, not really Wyoming, which is 69, and Utah, which is, set, I'm sorry, 1869, and Utah, which is 1870, um, which are doing slightly different things. I mean, the, the idea in, in Wyoming, of course, is that there are no uh, women in Wyoming, so they're really hoping to attract more. And, uh, and in Utah, the idea in 1870 is to guarantee that women are going to vote against polygamy and when they vote, vote in favor of polygamy, in fact, um, uh, there's an attempt to take out, uh, to, to get rid of the um, of women of women's suffrage after that. But um, the idea of women's voting in the 19th century developing in the West is in part because there are not laws there to begin with. So there's nothing to overturn the way there is in the East. But also often that language is couched in um, we're happy to let white middle-class women vote because they've got to be better than the African-Americans who are voting. There is within it, uh, if you will, a sense of the reinforcement of the idea of a world that is dominated by white men of some property. Because again, the assumption is gonna be that the women are gonna vote like their husbands do, which they do, by the way, until 1980. That's when we first get the gender split in American voting. And um, so, so I think it, that's a really important, um, uh, important caveat that you've identified, I don't think it necessarily suggests that um, that there is an inclusion of women in the West ideologically on the same um, on the same concept of equality that the men, the white men, are um, are being included simply because there's the idea that women will be uh, wives will vote as wives and mothers. That's literally how they portray the, the idea that they should vote, and that they will, by definition, add numbers to their husbands and sons that will enable them to overawe the voting of people of color. Um, yeah, that's pretty, kind of a weird hair splitting there. Really, really interesting because what you're saying is that the the extension of the rights contained or were colored by prejudiced in in itself um oh and they say so they say so really quite deliberately if you look at I, for some like bizarre reason i read the the suffrage debates in wyoming which uh, they may not be that easily available um but but they literally say you know i'm all for letting letting women they call them women vote because they're not talking about women of color at point because they've got to be better than all those you know uh, you can imagine the use of the words in the south yeah uh, uh, thank you for that, Heather. Here's a question from Linda G, who asks you, for those who fail or struggle to understand the notion that the Democratic and Republican parties essentially reverse their roles, can you point them to a key moment or event that illustrates that flip? It may help some modern Republicans better understand that their party is in fact the party currently on the side of the KKK and racism, even though some of their members wish to claim the opposite. Yes, that's a that's kind of a at this point a, a a real hot spot in the way we understand our history, and it's actually a really interesting history. And and I can't tell you how much I would love to go at real length about this because it's really more complicated. Excuse me than than most people realize. Um, that's actually what I've been researching all summer. Um, but the the moment you want, of course, is uh, the nomination of Barry Goldwater in 1819, I'm sorry, 1964 by the South Carolina uh, delegation of the Republican Party. And um, the the Goldwater's um, 
pre uh, presidential candidacy deliberately run, he deliberately runs on the idea that the use of the federal government to level the playing field between African Americans and Mexican Americans, although that's not really talked about at the time, but African Americans, at least in the in the his platform. African Americans and white Americans is unconstitutional. And this has been an idea that's been pushed since the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954. And when uh, William F. Buckley Jr. starts the National Review, it's just National Review, not the National Review, in 1955, he quite deliberately brings on board a guy named James Kilpatrick, who was an editor in Virginia. And he makes the argument that this is activism. This is judicial activism, although they're not going to use that word for a few decades. And that what this means is that the federal government is forcing something onto white people. And that's uh, the idea that gets picked up in 1960 in the book that is published over Barry Goldwater's name, although he doesn't write it. It's actually William F. Buckley Jr.'s brother-in-law, L. Brent Bazell, who writes it the conscience of a conservative, in which it says that if the federal government gets involved in things like uh, like racial equality, they also talk about farmers as well, it's going to mean that they are essentially ushering in communism or socialism because it's going to cost tax dollars to have a government that can do these things. And so Barry Goldwater makes a stand against the federal government enforcing desegregation and integration. And when that happens, um, very dramatically, Strom Thurmond, who had been, a, he's from South Carolina. He had been a Dixiecrat, and which is a fervent uh, segregationist, despite the fact that he had fathered a son, I'm sorry, a daughter on uh, uh, the, with his uh, family's uh, African-American maid when she was a teenager. Um, uh, he was a staunch segregationist, and he, having been the leader of the Democratic Dixiecrats, switches sides and endorses Barry Goldwater. Now, of course, Barry Goldwater's campaign goes down in flames. He loses everything except his home state of Arizona and five deep southern states. Those Democrats have switched over to join him. And in 1968, when Richard Nixon is running, he needs to pick up those people. And what he does is he literally goes, you can read about in his memoirs, he literally goes to Strom Thurmond. He goes to Strom Thurmond and he says, if you will continue to back me, a Republican candidate, I will promise not to use the federal government to enforce desegregation across the South. And it's that's the big split right there. And then, of course, you see it um, in, in after 60, after uh, after Nixon is elected, of course, he's reelected in 72. He uh, crashes and burns with Watergate. He has to resign in 74. Jimmy Carter gets elected in 76 because there's just no way a Republican's going to be coming back from Watergate in two years. But when Ronald Reagan and who is the next Republican who's really going to be able to take office. Uh, when he comes in, he absolutely plays on that by declaring um, that he is in favor of states' rights and declaring uh, you know, his candidacy right there in Philadelphia, Mississippi, right where three civil rights workers have been murdered. And he, you know, he, he runs on, on the campaign of being against the, the, the what he calls the welfare queen, which is pretty clearly in his mind an African-American woman. So you get the linkage of taxes and race there beginning in the, the period after Brown versus Board of Education, harking back to Reconstruction, but you really see it taking off with um, the switch of Strom Thurmond in 64 to back Barry Goldwater, and then Richard Nixon's deliberate use of what his advisor, Lee Atwater, did call the Southern strategy. That is a brilliant description of the whole trajectory, Heather. Thank you so much. I, I'm so sorry, but we are we could be talking to you for ages, but we're out of time. Um, so I want to thank you, Heather Cox Richardson, for sharing your time with us so generously today, um, Sunday. We've been speaking with Heather Cox Richardson, whose latest book is How the South Won the Civil War. Uh, you can find her presentation, wonderful presentation, on, this, on the um, history and biography stage of the National Book Festival at llc.gov slash bookfest. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Heather. And thank you to everybody. I didn't get to half or even a quarter of the questions that were here for you, but um, we hope the conversation will keep going. And thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you all for being here and thanks for having me.